I uh, also want to just express my deep gratitude for your prayers, for your support for me and my kids here, Kara and CJ. We are doing well, even through this very difficult time. We've been under lockdown as all of you have been. And we feel isolated physically from everyone. We love to be out and about, but we, have, we can't do that now. Uh, and so it's a little bit of a challenge, but we're thankful that God is still present with us and that we can fellowship with people like you in this way virtually. And so uh, we just want to say thank you for your prayers, for your support, for your encouragements, and please continue to keep us in your prayers as we do keep you in our prayers as well. I'm going to be speaking this morning from First Chronicles chapter 28, and I will read from verse 9 to 21. And the theme for this message is teaching your children to trust God. And pretty much what we'll be considering is the necessity or the role, the responsibility that we as parents have to teach our children to trust God at all times, for we don't know when they may, have, they may have to. So if you're a parent, hear this message that God expects you to trust, to teach your children to trust God at all times, because you don't know when they may have to. So let's read together the word of God, and then I'll pray before we proceed. First Chronicles, chapter 28, verses 9 to 21. And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father, and serve him with your whole heart, and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you forever. Be careful now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Then David gave Solomon his son the plan for the, of the vestibule of the temple and of its houses, its treasuries, its upper rooms, and its inner chambers, and of the room for the mercy seat, and the plan for of all that he had in mind for the courts of the house of the Lord, all the surrounding chambers, the treasuries of the house of God, and the treasuries for dedicated gifts, for the divisions of the priests and of the Levites, and all the work of the service in the house of the Lord, for all the vessels for the service in the house of the Lord, the weight of gold for all golden vessels for each service, the weight of silver vessels for each service, the weight of, gold, of, of the golden lampstands and their lamps, the weight of gold for each lampstand and its lamps, the weight of silver for a lampstand and its lamps, according to the use of each lampstand in the service, the weight of gold for each table, for each for the showbread, the silver for, for the silver tables, and pure gold for the forks, the basins and the cups, for the golden bowls, and the weight of each for the silver bowls, and the weight of each for the altar of incense made of refined gold and its weight. Also his plan for the golden chariot of the cherubim that spread their wings and covered the ark of the covenant of the Lord. All this he made clear to me in writing from the hand of the Lord, all the work to be done according to the plan. Then David said to Solomon his son, be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, is with you. He will not leave you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. And behold, the divisions of the priests and the Levites for all the service of the house of God and with you in all the work will be every man, every willing man who has skill for any kind of service. Also the officers and all the people will be holy at your command. That is our reading this morning, and I pray that God will bless his word to us, to his glory. Let's ask for his blessing. Oh God, our Father, we pray now that you will speak to us 
Encourage our hearts, O oh God, with your word. Teach us to trust you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Teach us to love you and to love our neighbors. And help us, O oh God, as parents to love our children by showing them who you are, that they may know you and to make you known. In Jesus' name, amen. I just mentioned here at the beginning that I have uh, two little ones in the house, so you may see them walking around. Hopefully they'll be quiet and you know, just settled on where they are. But uh, it has happened on BBC, you've probably seen some reporters and they're trying to, they're working from home and then you see little kids walking around. And so if it happens on BBC, I'm sure it could happen here. But uh, I want to begin by reading a story for you, um, which I think will be helpful to uh, get our hearts and our minds ready for the message this morning. A businessman was the last person before the gates closed. Sweating and out of breath, he scanned his boarding pass at the counter and quickly made his way to the plane. Arriving at his seat, he greeted those with whom he would share company for the next few hours. A middle-aged woman sitting at the window and a little girl sitting on the aisle seat. After stowing his bag above, he took his place between them. And after the flight took off, he began a conversation with the little girl. She appeared to be about the same age as his daughter and was busy with her coloring book. He asked her a few unusual, he, he asked her a few usual questions, such as her age, and she was eight. Her hobbies, she liked cartoons and drawing, as well as her favorite animal. Horses are pretty, she said, but she just loved cats. He found it strange that such a young girl would be traveling alone, but he kept his thoughts to himself and decided to keep an eye on her to make sure she was comfortable. About an hour into the flight, the plane suddenly began experiencing extreme turbulence. The pilot came over the PA system and told everyone to fasten their seat belts and remain calm as they had encountered rough weather. Several times over the next three quarters of an hour, the plane made drastic dips and turns, shaking all the while. Some people crying and many, like the woman in the window seat, were praying intently. Others were cursing and swearing at the, pi swearing at the pilot. Even calling him incompetent. The man sweating and clenching his seat as tightly as he could and exclaiming, exclaiming oh my God, with each increasing violent shake of the plane. Meanwhile, the little girl was sitting quietly beside him in her seat. Her curling book and crayons were put away neatly in the seat pocket in front of her and her hands were calmly resting on her legs. Incredibly, she didn't seem worried at all, but gazed at the cursing quartet with anguish, sometimes shaking her head in disapproval of the attacks against the pilot. Then just as suddenly as it had begun, the turbulence ended. Then, pilot came on a, then the pilot came on a few minutes later to apologize for the bumpy ride and to announce that they would soon be landing. As the plane was about to begin its descent, the man said to the little girl, you are just a little girl, but I have never met a braver person in all my life. Tell me, dear, how is it that you remain so calm while all of us adults were so afraid? Looking at him in the eyes, she said, the pilot is my father, and I knew he would surely take me home. If we recognize the power of faith in all circumstances we face in our lives, we know that nothing is too difficult for our gods to do. We can always trust him. And even little children, eight years old or younger even, can be taught to trust God. And so teach your children to trust God because you do not know when they may have to. And this was the experience that Solomon had with David.
Sorry guys, my daughter is in the room and she's praising the Lord singing, but I want her to be quiet. So we'll proceed from here. Yes, Karen, you can go to your room and sit there also. David was a man after God's own heart. And as we know, he was king of Israel and his kingship was actually the greatest of all the kings of the, all the kingships that Israel had. And Solomon, as his son, had the benefit of growing up with David as his father. Just a minute, I'm going to take them to my... Yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm back and we'll proceed. Um, so Solomon has this wonderful privilege of growing up with David as his father. But I want us to begin by looking at David himself and who he was as the man after God's own heart. All of you know that David was the son of Jesse. And as a young man, he was chosen by God. God sent Samuel to go and anoint David to be the next king after Saul. And as a young man, David already knew God. And of course, he learned that from his father, Jesse. And here already we are beginning to see a pattern of generational faith. The faith that David had, he learned from his father, Jesse. And even as a young man, as a shepherd boy, while he was in the wilderness uh, taking care of his father's sheep, he knew that God was with him. And you know the story of how he... Uh, overpowered the bear and the lion when they're trying to attack his father's sheep because he had that faith in God that God would protect him God would be with him and that was also preparation for another greater victory that David was going to accomplish for the people of Israel how he defeated Goliath we read this story in first Samuel chapter 17 and David could look back to what God had done for him as a shepherd boy and he was able to say, God, the same God who delivered me from the hand of the, from, from the, from the, from the mouth of the lion and the bear, the same God would, would um, also deliver him when he was encountering the giant uh, Goliath as they were fighting the Philistines. And so we see this pattern of generational faith, Jesus' faith being passed on to David, and now David passing on his faith to his son Solomon, who was going to be who was the next king after him. And as parents, and specifically I want to address fathers this morning, we have a great responsibility to pass on the faith that we have in God to the next generation. Those who have done some research and studies have always told us that the Christian faith is only one generation from extinction. That if we do not do a good job of passing on our faith to our children, to the next generation, then we're really not being very serious about our faith because it's just one generation away from extinction. And so this puts upon us a great responsibility to seek to be faithful, not only in following God ourselves, but in helping our children to follow God, to trust him, to trust him with all their hearts to trust him in all that they do because we live in a world that teaches us to trust ourselves or to trust other things to trust our money to trust our jobs to trust our whatever else it is the world is not telling us and certainly the world is not telling our children to trust god if anything the world especially we look around us here in canada the world is 
militating against anything to do with God. And so driving people, driving even our children further and further away from God. And so it is our responsibility as parents, first and foremost, we have been given this wonderful and incredible privilege of transmitting the faith that we have in God to our children. It's not even the first priority of the church. The church helps the parents to do that job well, but ultimately that responsibility rests on the family, the parents, the father and the mother together, working to inculcate, to pass on this faith that we have, the faith that has been passed on to us by our forefathers. We also do the same for our children. We must teach them early to trust God. We must teach them to trust God by our example, and we must do so consistently in our lives. And so back to the text that we read, David there begins, You Solomon, my son, know the God of your father, and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he'll be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you forever. He'll cast you off forever. Be careful, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. And I want to just draw your attention here to the words that David is using in his exhortation, in his, in his message to his son Solomon. When he talks about God, David is using very personal ter terms. For example, in verse 9, he says to Solomon, Know the God of your father. The God that David was talking about was not just the God who was there, but was a God that he knew personally. It was he, this, this God was his personal God. They had a personal relationship. And if you go down to verse 20, David there says to Solomon once again, Be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, is with you. This is how David is speaking concerning God, the God of heaven, Jehovah the one who is the God of Israel, the God of all of us. And David had was trying to communicate to, to his son, Solomon, that he had a personal relationship to this God. This God was his God. God belonged to David and David belonged to God. They belonged to each other. And I wonder for you and me today, if our children, when they look at us, do they see this personal relationship with God? Do they see, do they know that we have this personal relationship with God? Can we truly say with David, my God, the God that I'm talking about is my God. How does that begin? It begins with us acknowledging Christ Jesus as Lord over our lives, acknowledging him as a savior who came to take away our sin and brought us into this family of God. We acknowledge that Christ took away our sin. We are sinners. We are born in sin and that we cannot save ourselves. No matter what we do, we cannot save ourselves by being good or by doing good. That our salvation, our relationship with God depends on the work that Christ accomplished on the cross in our place, on our behalf. And that we stand on his righteousness. When we put our faith in Christ, then we are brought into this wonderful relationship with God. And so it begins there that we have a very solid and healthy relationship with God. If we're going to really pass on this faith to our children, we must not, we, we cannot just do it by words. It has to be something that is real for us first and foremost. And so each one of us as who are parents and even grandparents will be talking, I, will, I'll talk, maybe I may come back to this a little bit later. Even as grandparents, we have to examine ourselves to say, am I standing in the faith? Am I having, do I have a vibrant living 
relationship with the God of the universe? Do my children see that? Do they know that? I, do I model that for them? Because as all of you parents know, children learn by watching us, by what they observe. Yes, we sit down with them sometimes and we give them advice about this, yeah, about yeah. the other thing. But ultimately, the things that will really, the lessons that will really last with them, the lessons that will really shape who they become in life are the lessons that they're going to learn by observing us, how we relate to God, how we relate to one another, how we relate to other people around us, how we respond to life circumstances, how we pray, how our prayer life is, how we spend time in the word, all those things, how we work, all those things are going to be the things that will make a lasting impact upon our, our children's lives. And so it begins here, the most fundamental principle that we need to learn if we really are serious about passing on the faith that we have in God to our children is our personal relationship with God. We must have a solid and found a relationship with God. And therefore we can then teach them to trust God by our own example. And we must start early. It's not, you, you, you can't start early enough. Start when they're young, when they're really young and keep doing it consistently every day and i'm going to offer some practical tips that i have personally used and have been a blessing to me also and i thank god because i grew up in a family where this was modeled and my parents taught us about god from a very young age every single day would gather together as a family around the word of god and my parents my dad would would lead the family in family worship he would open the scriptures every day and he would e explain to us what the Bible says, what God, who God is and who and what God expects of us. Yeah, they would only not, not only pray for us, but they prayed with us every single day. And that is something that I also hope and pray that God will help me to continue doing with my own children here. Uh, because it's so vital and so important and to make it effective we have to be very intentional in how we do it so solomon was a beneficiary of the faith that david had in god this very personal and vibrant faith and when you study the life of david you see time and time again how god came through for him in very difficult situations, in very difficult circumstances. And, and it, we also see how David relied on God. He didn't do it perfectly, as we all know. There were times when his faith lapsed, his faith was weak, and he was lured into sinful behaviors and practices, which brought, again, brought about heavy consequences on him and his family. But nevertheless, he was a man who was very intent on trusting God, following him and serving him. And he did and he, he did that knowing that God was with him and he would help him. Uh, and he says to his Solomon, to his son Solomon, this God, this my God is going to be with you as you go through life. As God has been with me, this God also will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you until all the work of the service of the house of the Lord is finished. And I'm not going to go into the details of what was involved in uh, the construction of the temple here. The point I'm really trying to communicate to us, all of us as parents today, is to teach our children to trust God. Because then when they come to situations when they need to trust God, it will be something that happens so naturally. And we'll be able to look back and see how great it has been for for us to share that faith with our children as they grow up in this world that is in this world that is so hostile to the christian faith as the apostle john writes there's no greater joy than to see our children walking in the faith you know a lot of fathers they want to leave so many things for their children they want to leave a good heritage uh, for their children and but often the things that we want to leave for our children are confined to temporary prosperity 
This was not the case with David. David wanted so much that Solomon, his son, would be able to have a stable and a solid faith in God. Because Solomon had been also called to a wonderful work. He had been given a very high calling to serve as king of the people of Israel. David knew that character is a key to all of life that God wants us to have. And so his supreme desire for Solomon was that he should be right at heart with God, that his principles would be sound, that he should honor, that he should trust God and serve him wholeheartedly. And so we see that early on in his life, he begins to teach Solomon how it is, how important it is to trust God. Let me give you some practical helps that I have found uh, to be effective in my own life, but also which I think you might be find, might be help, help, helpful and effective for you. First of all, I mentioned uh, it briefly, but I want to spend a bit more time on this. Fathers, it is our, our responsibility to gather the family around the word of God every day. Daily devotions, some people call it, or family worship. This is a lost art. In generations past, this was something that was just expected in Christian families. I was privileged one time to go to Scotland. And as I was there mingling and, you know, just interacting with Christians and fellow pastors, I learned so many, so many, so many wonderful stories of how it was in Scotland back in the day when every family, every household was practicing family worship. And some, one of the older ministers told me that there were times when you would be uh, walking around along the streets uh, in Scotland, in the different villages, and you'd be hearing from house to house, singing, families, husband, wife, children, singing God's praise every single evening as they had gathered around the word of God. And today that is no longer the case in many homes, even Christian homes. And so I want to encourage you, if you're not already doing this, start. It's not too late to start. Uh, husbands and, and, and fathers and mothers together, bring your children around the word of God, even as you do so around the dinner table. And one of the ways perhaps to, to do that, to start, is just every, every time you gather together for, a di for dinner together, that you also then spend time reading the Bible together or singing God's praise and praying together and just make that part of your normal daily routine. Secondly, I mentioned also, pray regularly for your children. We pray about many things in the world, in our lives, our job, our health, our finances, and so many other things. But praying for our children is one of the best things we can do for them. Because we're really saying to God, Lord, these are your children. I'm only a steward. You entrusted me with these children. I don't have what it takes to raise them up in your ways. I need your help. And God will honor those prayers. But not only are we to pray for our children, we're also to pray with them. Our children need to know that we commit them to the Lord. Our children need to know that we love them so much and that we want God's blessing upon their lives. God will honor those prayers and our children will learn by example also to pray to God, to speak to God and to seek to follow him and to do what he requires of them. We also need to teach them discipline. This is another lost art today. Discipline to obey and respect authority. Many, uh, many parents today do not model this because we live in a society, we live in a, in a culture where it seems to me more and more increasingly, there is no respect for authority. No discipline whatsoever with respect to time, with respect to work ethics, with respect to so many even moral uh, boundaries. And our responsibility as parents is to, to model by example 
disciplines that God requires of us as his followers, as his children. We must point them to what the Lord requires of us. And it's very interesting when you read the scriptures that in all of the scriptures, there's only one command that really God gives to the children that is to obey their parents in the Lord. We need to teach them obedience and, by, and do so by creating very firm and healthy boundaries for them because they need to learn now to create boundaries for themselves but also to respect other people's boundaries and most importantly to respect the boundaries that God has placed for us, for our well-being, for our safeguarding, for our security. Solomon learned this from his father even though later on in life he he he, he made very bad choices and paid very high price for it. He knew that this was what God required of him. And he would later come back and ask God to forgive him. So as parents, we have this wonderful privilege as the children are getting older day by day to be very intentional in family worship day by day, spending time with them around the word of God, in praying for them and in disciplining them correcting them uh, when they do wrong we must not shy away Stay from away. it the bible tells us that we must not spare the rod and spoil the child we must teach the children in the ways that they should go while they're young because when they get older they will not depart from those ways and david understood this the, the importance that he had an obligation he had a duty to teach his son solomon to remember his creator in the days of his youth. And he also showed him that the assurance of the Lord's perfect knowledge that the Lord searches our hearts and he understands the imaginations and the thoughts of our hearts, that the Lord sees what is inside of us. And we must seek to be clean before him. We must seek to be right with him in our lives. And we must learn to trust him. We must seek him every single day. And there is a wonderful encouragement that he gives to his son. Encouragement of the promise that if we seek God, he will be found by us. He's not a God who is, you know, trying to hide from us. When we seek him, he's, he will be found by us if we seek him with all of our heart. And there are so many assurances in the Bible that encourage us in this particular aspect of seeking God and seeking God, especially with regards to our salvation. Our children are born in sin, just like all of us. And oftentimes I look at parents and they talk about how cute and wonderful their children are. And, and I thank God for that. I thank God for my two children. I am blessed to have them, but I also know that they were born in sin and that they will need at some point in their lives to seek God on their own for their own salvation, to find for, so they can find forgiveness in him. And as I pray for them, I pray towards that, that they will be given this deep conviction of sin in their lives, that they will be drawn to Christ and that they would trust in him for their salvation because that is the first thing that they need to trust God for. Everything else follows from that. They need to trust God for salvation because they cannot save themselves. And there's a promise that when we see God like that, we will find him. And when we find him, we'll be blessed. We'll be, we'll be, uh, we'll, we will know the joy and the peace that only he offers. But then the flip side of that, there is a warning that if we forsake God, he will also forsake us. He will cast us off. And that is very scary when you think about it. That if we do not teach our children right now to seek God, they will end up forsaking God. And if they forsake God, then God will forsake them. Because God will not force himself upon anyone. God wants to be worshipped voluntarily. He wants to be loved voluntarily otherwise the love that we give to him if it's not force it's not really love it's something else god will want us to follow him because we 
we we we have we have seen value in that we we want to our hearts have been drawn to who he is and to the the, the wonder the beauty that we see in him through Jesus Christ and so there is a fearful warning here for all of us as parents that if we really believe what the bible says about salvation about heaven and hell that we will take our responsibility seriously to inculcate to impress upon our children the necessity the absolute necessity of trusting god always day by day because we don't know when they will have to trust him as they go through life so we must have a plan we must be intentional we must be practical in doing this and we must also be very alert be looking for teachable moments as we go through life this was what the children of israel were taught were 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 commanded to do as you go through life in Deuteronomy chapter 6 teach your children about god let teach them to love god with all their hearts so mind and strength and to love uh, each to love their neighbors as themselves we must aim at progress, not perfection. Our children will not get this perfectly as they get older, as, they, as, as we teach them. Neither will we. We will not get it perfectly. But we must seek to be progressing, to be growing in this day by day. This is what God expects of us. Progress, not perfection. And as we do so, depending on him, he will bless us. And David was a blessing to Solomon, his son. Because we remember at one time when, after David was gone and Solomon had to encounter God and ask for God, something from God. God said, what do you want me to do for you? He asked for wisdom. And it was that wisdom that carried through, that divine wisdom that helped Solomon to do what he had been called to do for God in his time, in his kingship. And so we pray, and I pray for my own children day by day, that they will learn to trust God in their lives, even as they are young, and that they will live their lives depending on God's wisdom, not on the wisdom of the world. And finally, in closing, in all of this, we see what, what a great example Jesus Christ is, the true son of David, who uh, actually trusted God in all of his life as he walked this earth seeking to accomplish the mission that God had given him. He lived each day of his life trusting God. He never did anything in his own power, in his own strength. And even as he was hanging on the cross, dying for the sins of the world, for your sins and for my sins, you remember he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God was still his God. He could refer to him as his God, my God. And so this is what we want for our children, that no matter how difficult life gets, they will still be able to say to God, my God, my God, and that they'll go through life trusting him and serving him joyfully all the days of their lives. Let us pray.